Good morning or afternoon to the audience, wherever you are turning in, and thank you to the National Trust for hosting this forum. My name is Terry Gouin, and I am with Barbara Wyatt, who will also speak on behalf of Project Archaeologist Scott Baxter. Our presentation is called Racial Equity Bingo, in reference to our experience that there is no obvious straight line, but a multi-step, multi-year process sometimes complex, to newly engage immigrant aspects of American history, working with groups who have been historically excluded. We will discuss Asian American preservation, but please keep in mind how the same situation may apply to underrepresented groups of different ethnicities. This topic will grow in relevance as current immigrant waves of naturalized Americans gain residence over each 50 years. Without advocacy, education, and invitation to be included, it is not obvious why historic preservation is for everyone and how creating a broader vision for cultural heritage can be beneficial and essentially grow the preservation audience. Please read these learning objectives. They are, why is the right of access to one's cultural history a human right? Why might underrepresented groups be hesitant to engage with historic preservation? How can our nation's history be embodied in a large scale cultural historic landscape? What qualifies a remote historic landscape to become eligible for national landmark consideration? And what is AAPI? First, the right to culture the 2001 UNESCO Declaration on Cultural Diversity defines the right to culture as the right of access to participation and enjoyment of culture, including the right of individuals and communities to know, understand, visit, make use of, maintain, exchange, and develop cultural heritage and cultural expressions, as well as to benefit from cultural heritage and expressions of others. So why is this knowing one's and other's culture relevant? This slide shows an article from Emory University in 2013, which points out a connection between social and emotional health and one's knowledge of family history. It makes sense not living the shadows or, or with a sense of shame that this is associated with wellness for some underrepresented groups. There is pain learning the truth about racism and violence towards their ancestors. For others, it is a discovery of ancestor achievement, which gains a sense of social and racial equity in being proudly and historically recognized. For those new to historic preservation, I'd like to relate my own learning experience. In 2011, I was appointed by the Obama White House to the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation a DC-based federal agency. While I held useful qualifications as a landscape architect, I was far from the knowledge base of preservation professionals. My advocacy began after reading an article by Ken Salazar, then Department of Interior Secretary. He pointed out the Cesar Chavez landmark. It is based on stories of contribution to America, not on the quality of building finishes as had been properly observed. The 40 acre site additionally includes a retirement village, not for Latinos, but for the Filipino bachelors, court of the farm movement, who after working decades and not able to join their families needed a place to be cared for in retirement. At the advisory council, we met about three times a year in these stunning settings of the nation's capital at listening sessions around the country. Sometimes we were able to attend the back of the scenes field trips to the Smithsonian, Ellis Island, Customs House in Philadelphia, Weber City in Tampa, Florida, and the Squamish tribe in Puget Sound, among others. Of interest were special consultation hearings for Section 106. All the while I'm learning this and thinking, well, what about the Asian Americans? So playing catch up, including Asian American immigrant history in US history. Presently, 
there are around 24 million Asian Americans in the United States, which is a little over 7% of the population, includes all these um, places of origin. Uh, so we have Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, Pakistani, Thai, Hmong, Cambodian, Laotian, Taiwanese, Bangladeshi, Burmese, Nepalese, Indonesia, Sri Lankan, Malaysian, Tibetan, all who consider ourselves American. Populations per state, these are the highest populations of Asian Americans, uh, say states, and you'll notice that on the west coast, we have higher populations closer to the Pacific places of origin. And then as you go to the middle and then the eastern seaboard, those percentages per state uh, go down. But most importantly, Asian Americans collectively are one of the largest uh, growing populations, according to our recent census demographic, going from 24 million in 2020, projected to over 36 million in the next 40 years. These are people who um, are now gaining representation in state, local, and federal elected offices. Uh, we have English as primary and second languages, depending on the generation in all 50 states. These are folks that we want to be caring about a joined cultural heritage. This is, slide is of Little Manila Town in Stockton, California, where I first learned about the pain of racism and urban renewal. It was a meeting of AIPA HIP, the Asian Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. Once a thriving immigrant metropolis, um, Little Manila Town, shown here on the right, the slide, um, had been uh, designated as a place for urban renewal to allow the construction of the federal I-4 Crosstown Expressway. So Little Manila, Manila Town was removed, of which now you see three remaining largely empty buildings with a tiny sign in front of it. There's one building, the Confucian Center, which is this freestanding standing single building left from Chinatown, and then the rest of the area remains largely undeveloped. When I visited the site, my California cousins came to visit, and they called to me driving in um, from afar for restaurant supplies. Once it's an exciting trip with their dad, the place is now a haven for the homeless and addicted. I grew up in Boston, and in the 1970s, I heard from my activist parents in Boston's Chinatown um, had the suspicion of federal programs. And they were called people saying, remember what happened to Stockton? This distrust continued to 2013 when as a member of the advisory council, I asked to hold a listening session in Boston. So here we are on the left at the old South Meeting House and the advisory council wanted to know why would a 140-year-old historical community not be interested at all in participating in any federal preservation programs? At the same year, a couple months later, we had a listening session also at Angel Island in California, which I would cons consider the exemplary version of an AAPI heritage site. So moving forward with the help of the Massachusetts State SHPO, um, the community was uh, successful in applying for a National Park Service underrepresented grant. And it was the, um, the applicant was the Chinese Historical Society of New England and the building owner, which eventually we negotiated to include, was the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. We had meetings and the community would discuss things like, well, these preservationists, they only care about the bricks. They don't care about the people. But what we came up with was three potential buildings of which the one on the bottom, um, the old Josiah Quincy School, which was now a community center, was selected uh, for the application. 
in uh, receiving the $20,000 grant, uh, the SHPO was able to hire an excellent consultant to write the nomination. Now, um, because of the lack of English language, early century history about the Chinese immigration, um, the first draft was rejected. The SHPO thought it was overly negative, talking about uh, gangland slings, sensationalized in the Boston Globe. Um, there are articles about Chinese displacement due to um, overhead uh, you know, transit lines being put in, but nothing was written about family life or community or uh, commercial entities or restaurants or laundries, uh, which later on with a lot of study, the consultant was able to consolidate with help of the community. In the end, after four years, the Quincy School, its current picture on the right and its historical picture on the left, was um, received received listing in the National Register. And just to let you know that in the 70s, the community did investigate, could they be listed? And at the time, the response was, well, you're missing the cupola and the rooftop of the building, which was blown off in a hurricane in the mid 1800s. So because of the lack of integrity, they weren't allowed um, to apply. Uh, things are quite different now. I'm very appreciative as a result of receiving um, the status, the community is able to now have a stronger historical self-identity. Um, they've gained a tab on the city's historic tourism website. They've had access to preservation-related government grants. And now there's sort of an equity between this neighborhood and other Boston neighborhoods, such as the North End who for a long time had already received historic status. And just as a final note, this owner was not interested in preservation tax benefits. So as much as that is a very popular um, attribute as a not-for-profit, they were not interested. So um, just to say also, the National Register application presentation to the community was in English and Cantonese, and the community organization which included over 40 Chinatown organizations, many people remained skeptical. However, perhaps, and ultimately honoring the ancestors, they did vote yes. So now we'll go on to the part two of our presentation with the 20 minute video entitled Legacy. In 2010, my father passed away and some family and business took me to China. I'm first born American Chinese on my dad's side of the family and my wife and I both moved there um, to Hong Kong and Beijing where we lived for almost five years. We really enjoyed our time but it was time to move on. And so we moved back to Lake Tahoe. Pretty much 90% of my work is spent in the mountains here. It's interesting, you know, I moved here from China to pursue work and being back here on Donner Summit where I've climbed and like knew a little bit about the history, whether it be the Donner Party or how the railroads were built by the Chinese here. And I'm like, oh, I'm not the first person to move here from China and try to make a living and a better life for myself. In the years after the Civil War, the Transcontinental Railroad was nearing completion. As the railroad was making progress, there was one really formidable barrier, and that was the 7,000-foot summit of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. 
To build a railroad across these mountains, the Central Pacific turned to an unlikely workforce, the Chinese. The builders of the railroad realized they didn't have enough workers to do the thing. So they said, well, let's try the Chinese. We're here mining or doing other things like this. And they started the crew right here in Auburn. They realized that the Chinese were such a great workforce that they decided to start recruiting Chinese to the point where you almost had up to, we don't know the exact numbers, but there could be 12 to 20,000 workers coming and made up 80 to 90% of the Central Pacific Railroad's workforce. The location chosen to cross these mountains was Donner Pass on the present-day Tahoe National Forest. There are three sites within the boundaries of the Tahoe National Forest related to the construction of the Central Pacific Railroad. These sites are all that remain and exemplify the incredible effort that it took to blast the railroad through the Sierra Nevada mountains. China Wall was constructed by hand block by block. It supported the original alignment of the Central Pacific Railroad. <laughs> Summit Camp was a work camp. There were barracks, there were cookhouses, there were stables for horses, so it was definitely an area where there was a collection and a focus for work activities. There were maybe 3,000 people at that camp that lived over there for over two years building that tunnel and adjacent areas to the tunnel. Construction of the summit tunnel was slow and laborious. Workers were only able to move 14 inches of rock a day. To blast through the granite, hand charges had to be set. Holes were drilled by hand using a drill and a sledgehammer. A charge was then set with black powder, and after the blast, a different crew would come in to remove the waste rock. And it was through two of the worst snowstorms ever recorded in history. They were building this tunnel, which is five football fields long. And I find that remarkable. That was 1866, 1867. Today it would be hard during summertime to think about them doing that during the winter, I think is incredible. This was the highest elevation tunnel ever built in the world at the time. They had to invent techniques to do this. And it was all done by hand. How could we do these things? It was really Chinese labor who changed America. It was an American project, it was designed, it was directed by Americans, built with American capital. But the hands, the feet, the labor, the sweat, the grunting, the pain, the death, the accomplishments were all Chinese oriented. The story of the summit tunnel, the summit tunnel itself, that term, should be as compelling or evocative to us as when we hear the words, the Trail of Tears, or the Underground Railroad, or the Oregon Trail, or Route 66. We need to tell that as part of our hour, and that's the collective hour folklore. In 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad is complete. Leland Stanford drove a gold spike into the last rail at Promontory Summit, Utah, and the nation cheered. The Transcontinental Railroad revolutionized trade 
It united East and West. It opened up international markets from Asia all the way to Europe. And eventually it revolutionized the American economy, as well as the way that we travel. Here in, in my time, we have the internet that allows us to send email across the world or across the street in real time. These are analogous events and they both changed how we live. There's a chapter in American history that belongs to the Chinese and that a lot of it has to do with the construction of the Transcontinental and how the Transcontinental Railroad transformed this country. Following the completion of the railroad, this huge surplus Chinese workforce was no longer welcome. Pent-up discrimination and the, and the introduction of more onerous laws and, and unfortunately common values that, that espoused hatred and prejudice um, caused many Chinese to return to China. It caused others to go off and do subtle work, but the, the drumbeat of discrimination and hatred towards Chinese people kept increasing and, and that culminated in 1882 with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So in 1882, Congress passed a, what might be called the first comprehensive immigration law, in which it excluded Chinese from immigrating to the United States, and then uh, it, it prevented Chinese from becoming American citizens. And it actually illustrates one of the tensions that occur throughout the American history from its beginning. So that tension has always been there. It's illustrated in the Chinese case that after we have built this railroad because we needed laborers, we bring in immigrants or, alien, or people from another country. 14 years later, we then try to kick them all out. Following the passage of the 1882 Act, the Chinese contribution to our country began to be forgotten or neglected or maybe consciously excluded from our memory. By the early 20th century, not many people thought about this or even realized these things had happened. And in 1969, perhaps the biggest snub occurred at the centennial of the completion of the railroad. A representative of the Historical Society was invited to be at that May 10th ceremony at Promontory. That individual was Phil Choi. So there was a lot of anticipation and a feeling that, aha, you know, it took a hundred years, but we're finally going to get our just recognition. He gets to the ceremony and then he's told, oh, we are sorry, Mr. Choi, but we have taken you off the program because the program just doesn't have enough time. But then he had to sit through the keynote speaker, who was then the Department of Transportation Secretary, John Boltby, who said, who else but Americans could drill 10 tunnels in mountains 30 feet deep in snow? Who else but Americans could chisel through miles of solid granite? The snub in 1969 um, inspired a number of people to try to make it right. In 2011 and 2012, we got both the Senate and the House to agree to resolutions that talk about, uh, we actually put into the official record then, the congressional record, the history of Chinese migration here, their contributions to the country, and the reactions which the United States had to them. Another part of the effort was that at the appropriate milestone or celebrations, that our stories, the Chinese story, was covered, would be voiced. The, uh, the group's consensus was we couldn't just drop it. You had to form something that continued to tell the story. Things began to change as the country neared the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike Ceremony in 2019. This time, a lot of groups, including the U.S. Forest Service, the 1882 Foundation, the National Park Service, the Chinese Historic Society, and many other groups and individuals would work tirelessly to make sure that this time the story was told completely and accurately. The U.S. Forest Service is proud to help tell this story. Working with these organizations, the U.S. Forest Service has jointly hosted the Return to Gold Mountain Tours. 
The Return to Gold Mountain Tour provides an opportunity for descendants of the Chinese railroad workers, educators, and members of the public to visit important Chinese cultural heritage sites within the boundary of the Tahoe National Forest. So we are on a train from Reno to Sacramento as part of a historic tour. Shortly, I will be visiting both my paternal and maternal ancestral villages in the Pearl River Delta region in southern China. And as part of my uh, preparation work, I started to talk to a great uncle, and then he revealed to me that I actually have ancestors that worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. So in many ways, I feel like my homecoming has begun. The Forest Service is looking at opportunities to outreach to the urban, suburban populations, people that we might not normally connect with out on National Forest System lands. One way that we did this is going to the San Francisco Chinese New Year Festival, having a booth, bringing Smokey Bear, uh, talking to kids, parents, families, any member of the public, telling them about the Return to Gold Mountain Tour, opportunities to sign up, uh, giving them information about our Explore APA Heritage website, and giving them uh, a booklet so they can visit the sites on their own if they can't make the tour. And that's contributed to the public interest in the public lands. Because it's something that you don't normally think about Chinese and the forest or the outside. The Chinese historical sites within the boundaries of the Tahoe National Forest are so important. Many people don't realize they're there. Many people don't realize that this is a way that they can get to our National Forest System land and do something besides what we might think of as a traditional recreational opportunity. Hiking, camping, skiing, fishing, that type of thing. You can also go learn about our history and it's our nation's living history. On the Tahoe National Forest and many other sites, there's a renewed interest in the cultural history and the other cultural sites connected with these great events. So now you could really see the momentum as this story began to spread thanks to these people's efforts. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad is a huge story, but thanks to the contribution of the Chinese workers originally and the renewed enthusiasm of the people wanting to, to perpetuate their memory, the Chinese story became the dominant narrative connected with the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. We could not have asked for better media coverage of the 150th and the story of the Chinese. Everybody picked up on the, on the themes that we felt were important. One could argue that the culmination of all of these efforts was the 150th anniversary celebration at Promontory Summit, Utah. This time, the current Secretary of Transportation had something different to say. Today, at the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike Ceremony, marking the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad is a day to commemorate the contribution of railroads and the contribution and sacrifices of the railroad workers, including approximately 12,000 or more Chinese laborers who risked everything to make the Transcontinental Railroad a reality. Building from the West, the Central Pacific Railroad hired 15,000 workers, of which 12,000 or more were Chinese immigrants. These workers of Chinese ancestry blasted and chiseled their way through the rugged Sierra Nevada mountains using manual hammer drills, pick axes, and explosive. They dug 15 tunnels through pure, hard granite. An estimated 500 to 1,000 Chinese workers lost their lives. But the Chinese workers persevered and played a key role in building one of the greatest infrastructure projects in the world. I think we could be very happy that the story of, Chinese, of the Chinese contribution to the Transcontinental Railroad was finally told in all its glory. But you know what is really heartening during the 1882 project was as, as, as unknown as it was to so many people, how many surprised it was, was how welcoming people said, tell me more. 
tell me more about this story. I want to know. I want to know more details. I want it. Uh, I want it in our textbooks. I want it in our uh, public records and so forth. That is encouraging. And we had an elected official, or an appointed official, um, the Secretary of Transportation, speak on behalf of the country, acknowledging the contribution of Chinese workers. We couldn't have dreamt that in 1969. That gives us hope for the creation or continuation of what it is that should be American. Who make who are Americans? What that means, not just for my grandkids or uh, to acknowledge the fact that my grandfather and great grandfather they were important in building this nation, but it's also for everyone else who is an American trying to become part of this American nation. I'm so lucky that I get to even play here at all, and I'm like I like hit the lottery that I've been able to make it a living working and playing in the places that I love. Those feelings and those opportunities wouldn't have been available if it wasn't for the people that came before me, like my father and the immigrants that originally came here from China as laborers to build our infrastructure, such as these railroads here on Donner Summit. I think for me, I didn't really get a sense of the impact of my connection to this particular site until I walked through Summit Tunnel and then seeing that maybe this particular granite that I'm touching right now could be the same granite that my great-great-grandfather had touched. The original immigrants, they created a legacy of coming here to the United States to pursue a better life. And I'm proud to be a part of that legacy. Greetings. I hope you enjoyed that film. I retired from the National Park Service last year, although I considered my best contributions to be my work associated with cultural landscapes, I became the point person for Asian American and Pacific Islander issues. This work became one of my most fulfilling callings. I'm fortunate to have been asked to edit the National Historic Landmark theme study, Japanese Americans in World War II, published in 2012. Later, I was asked to assist Franklin Odo, editor of the AAPI theme study, Finding a Path Forward, published in 2017. The purpose of both publications was to provide context for evaluating properties related to these histories. Next. The NHL publications reflected growing interest by the federal government in, in expanding initiatives related to Asian American and Pacific Islander economic and social well-being. On June 7, 1999, President Clinton signed Executive Order 13125 that established the first White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. The purpose was, quote, to improve the quality of life of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders through increased participation in federal programs where they may be underserved. Each president after Clinton renewed the White House initiative. The White House initiatives were a catalyst for other AAPI activities in the federal government, including the Department of the Interior, 
Expanding inclusiveness to other groups poorly represented in interior programs became a priority. Funding for the development of the AAPI theme study was allocated during the Obama administration with Stephanie Toothman, Chief of Cultural Resources and Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, going to bat for the project. The Underrepresented Communities Grant Program was initiated in 2014 to support surveys of historic properties associated with communities underrepresented in the National Register. Over time, interest in the grant program has increased. State and municipal preservation offices have begun developing AAPI contexts and seeking both local designations and listings in the National Register. Thanks to these efforts, with many funded by NPS and state grants, National Register listings and local designations of AA, AAPI related resources is growing. Next. The nation's major preservation organizations also encouraged better inclusion and understanding, including the National Trust, the National Council on Public History, and the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. For several years, the National Trust has funded AAPI-related grant projects and has included AAPI themes at its annual Pass Forward conferences. The NAPC has also fostered AAPI inclusion, most recently by the formation of a discussion group concerned with equity and inclusion. But one of the earliest leaders in the AAPI preservation movement was API HIP, Asian Pacific Islanders and Historic Preservation, established in 2007, when Asian and Pacific Islander Americans noticed a lack of AAPI representation at state and national preservation meetings. Our interest today is the 1882 Foundation, it is not a dedicated historic preservation organization. Preservation is a facet of its based in Washington, D.C. The organization, quote, seeks to broaden public awareness of the history and continuing significance of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It does this through collaboration and an annual symposium in Washington by recording oral histories and by helping to strengthen public education efforts regarding the Chinese and Asian American experience. Next, why 1882? Although earlier laws were passed that explicit, explicitly discriminated against people of Chinese descent, in 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which imposed a 10-year moratorium on Chinese labor immigration. This was later expanded to apply to all persons of Chinese descent. Con Congress expanded the act in sub subsequent legislation imposing increasingly severe restrictions on immigration and naturalization. The Chinese exclusion laws were finally repealed in 1943 after China became a World War II ally of the U.S. Apologies for the egregious laws that discriminated against Chinese immigrants were a long time coming. On October 6, 2011, the Senate passed a resolution apologizing for passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act and other anti-Chinese legislation. On 18th, 2012, the House of Representatives passed a bipartisan resolution that formally expressed the regret of the House for the Chinese Exclusion Act and other anti-Chinese laws. Both resolutions passed unanimously. Next. One passion in the 82 Foundation is lack of public knowledge about the role of Chinese workers in construct transcontinental railroad. 85% of the force include uh, building the Pacific portion of the railroad were Chinese and recruited by the railroad because of their skill, stamina, and reliability. The story of the Chinese workers hasn't been told widely enough or linked to specific sites. Today, our focus is the legacy of those contributions in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California and Nevada. Next. Congress approved funding for construction of a cross-continental railroad in 1862. The segment from Council Blunt's Council Bluffs, Iowa, to Promontory Summit, Utah, would be by the Union Pacific Railroad. The segment from Sacramento to Utah would be built by the Central Pacific Railroad. It began in 1863. Central Pacific had the greatest challenges. After considering other options, the company decided to build a route through the rugged peaks of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Both terrain and, and weather would present extreme challenges. Next. In 1865, the CP decided to conduct a one-month experiment with Chinese workers. By then, there were some 60,000 Chinese in California. 
mostly adults and mostly men. Many had come in response to the gold rush. The discrimination against them was truly terrible, although Chinese workers were considered exemplary. An 1868 journal included high praise, quote, with his persistence, he accomplishes more work than the Caucasian. They quickly get the hang of whatever you set them at and soon display a remarkable adroitness. Every Chinaman reads and writes and in figures, he is our superior. In the CP's month-long experiment, Chinese workers, quote, had performed superbly. They worked as teams, took almost no breaks, learned how to blast away rocks, stay healthy and on the job. In short, the experiment had proved had eminently successful. That was just the beginning. What Chinese workers accomplished following the lead of railroad engineers was sort of miraculous. In the tough terrain of transcontinental route, they built rail retaining walls and a series of 15 tunnels of tracks, the longest tunnel number six, the, the, the summit tunnel. Next. Today, the tunnels behind a wall are owned by the Union Pacific Railroad. Some of the tunnels are used to access UP land, but are not used for train routes. The tunnels hold enormous appeal to hikers and other visitors. Surprisingly, the remark remarkable story of Chinese and Ch Chinese American contributions to construction of the railroad are not well known. The 1882 Foundation has been in changing that for several years, tours and other educational programs. Their efforts is public acknowledgement of the contributions of Chinese workers. And to me in 2018, when I worked for the National Register and National Marks Program at the National Park Service. The 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad was just around the corner and the 1882 Foundation wanted Chinese workers were acknowledged for their contributions during the hoopla of celebrations. Next, unlike in this historic photo, of the driving of the Golden Spamontory, where Chinese faces are absent. When 1882 approached me about options for public re recognition, their familiarity with NPS programs was slim. They had an idea that the tunnels in the High Sierras should become a national site. After I became familiar with the site through coaching by Ted Gong and colleagues at the 1882 Foundation, that the tunnels and associated walls had NHL potential. These thus ensued a series of gains and setbacks before the possibility for pursuing a nomination was realized. Next. The first barrier was the reluctance of the Union Pacific Railroad to agree to NHL nomination of the tunnels in the China Wall. For several months, the 1882 Foundation made valiant efforts to engage the railroad in conversations about this with little success. Meanwhile, the NHL program had funding for the preparation of a nomination related to AAPI history. I was spearheading the effort to find a good candidate and an historic district that encompassed three of the tunnels, the China Wall, and related archaeological sites. This was a high priority. Next. NHL nominations are not encouraged if owners object and lacking su success with the UP Railroad, the potential for a nomination was small. Federal funds, though, can't sit in debt and spent, so NPS needed to move on. Or, less visually spectacular but significant from a few perspectives were the archaeological sites associated with railroad construction. The largest Chinese work camp in the country was number six, and the China Wall was located on U.S. Forest Service land. The site had been made for many years. In fact, it made important early contributions to the field of historic archaeology, in addition to being an important cultural link to Chinese American history. A potential issue was the integrity of the archaeological site. The site may have been negatively impacted by highway and trail construction, looting, and the development of nearby ski resorts. None of the NHL staff had visited the site, including those in California, Washington, and Denver, so integrity remained a question. In 2020, a valiant NPS staff archaeologist, Doug Wilson, made a mad dash to the site just ahead of a massive snowstorm to see for himself if the site's integrity was problematic. By this time, NHL staff from Washington and three regions were rooting for the site, and we all breathed a sigh of relief when Doug reported that the site's integrity was fine. In 2020, the fieldwork research and writing necessary of an NHL nomination got underway. 
The 1882 Foundation was delighted, but was still engaged in other recognition strategies. A tremendous assist to their efforts was the National Trust's inclusion of the site, the tunnels, and the China Wall on the 11 most endangered list in 2021. Although necessarily vague about the exact location of the archaeological site, appreciation for the site was peaked and the resulting publicity was gratifying. There will not be a National Historic Landmark at the summit site until the nomination is completed, reviewed by the NHL committee, and signed by the Secretary of the Interior. The 1882 Foundation and NPS staff who have been involved in the initiative are hopeful that the efforts will be successful. Meanwhile, the 1882 Foundation continues to encourage the Union Pacific Railroad to recognize the importance of the tunnels, the walls, and the archaeological site on its land. The UP Railroad is proud of its history and understands the enormous value of these resources as a legacy of Chinese American and engineering history. But potential liability and the creation of an attractive nuisance is an overriding concern. The 1882 Foundation, as always, continues to have even bigger dreams, hoping for the establishment of a National Historic Site at the summit. By mustering the resolve and patience of their ancestors, someday this site and their ancestors will be given the national recognition they warrant. Thank you very much. Now we're moving on to Scott Baxter's presentation. Next slide, please. Scott Baxter has studied the Summit Camp archeology span site for more than 20 years. And Carrie Smith has been an archeologist for Tahoe National Forest for many years and is extremely familiar with the site. Neither Scott nor Carrie Smith could be present for this presentation, but Scott provided the slides and information that I'll share with you. Next. Building of the Transcontinental Railroad probably ranks below only the gold rush in its importance to the shaping of the American West. The railroad tied two disparate halves of the country together, allowing for the first time the rapid flow of goods, people, and ideas from one end of the country to the other. The completion of the railroad would not have been possible without the contributions of Chinese railroad workers. Summit Camp, in particular, was critical to this endeavor. The camp facilitated year-round occupation without long periods of seasonal breaks. The altitude is more than 7,000 feet, and the snowfall is significant. Today, the site is one of the most important archaeological sites associated with the Chinese workforce, but the, that built the Central Pacific portion of the, of the railroad. As one of the largest and most long-lived Chinese railroad construction camps, Summit camp has, camp has more archeological data potential than most. Investigations of the site began in the 1960s and have continued sporadically to the present. The workers who lived um, at the summit camp spent four years blasting thousands of feet of tunnel through solid granite, cutting grade through the same tough rock and building massive stonework structures to support the railroad. The China Wall, 75 feet high, is the tallest of the walls the Chinese were built. Without Summit Tunnel, the segments of the railroad over Donner Pass to the east would not have been possible. Next. In addition to the important information yielded by archaeological studies at the summit camp, it was also important to the development of historical archaeology as a field of study in the U.S. In the formative years of the field, the focus was on Euro-American settlements, primarily in the eastern U.S. In 1966, Bill Evans, Paul Chase, and Patricia Edders conducted a survey and surface collection of the summit camp, helping to launch interest in historic archaeological studies in the western U.S. Next. Their subsequent publications and presentations on the material culture of the site established Summit Camp as something of the site type for Chinese material culture in the West. As stated in the NPS AAPI theme study, quote, the pioneering work of Chase and Evans introduced the study of Chinese sites to the burgeoning field of historic archaeology, and their descriptions of Chinese artifacts from the site helped define the material significance of Chinese immigrant settlements and the degree to which they relied on imported consumer goods and maintained homeland practices. Next. With the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 2019, there is a renewed interest in the contribution, contributions of Chinese railroad workers. 
While much has been written about the railroad, there are few contemporary accounts concerning the lives of Chinese workers. Consequently, archaeology has much to contribute to the understanding of the lives of these men during the building of the railroad. The site has yielded perhaps the most ex extensive assemblage of artifacts related to Chinese workers, including tableware, woks, and other domestic items, clothing and personal items, gaming pieces, materials related to alcohol and drug use, and tools used in their work line. Much of this assemblage is now housed at the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. However, extensive deposits remain in situ at the site. In addition to the artifacts, the remains of the workers' cabins, workshops, and other facilities are scattered across the landscape, as are traditional Chinese cooking feet used to prepare meals for the workers. The summit camp has already yielded a great deal of information, yet its potential to shed light, even more light, on this important chapter of American history is strong. The need to pro protect the site and its related resources cannot be overstated. The number of people who appreciate the site has grown since the National Trust designated the site and, and related tunnels one of the 11 most endangered. Ongoing educational efforts by the 1882 Foundation, federal, state, and local governments, and local and regional, regional historical groups and agencies will also help with the site's preservation. Recognition as a National Historic Landmark or a National Historic Site is a dream and with hopes a future reality. Thank you very much. I'm turning it back to Terry. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> now I will recap the learning objectives from our session. This is what we covered. The right of access to one's cultural history and why it's a human right. Why underrepresented groups may be hesitant to engage with the historic preservation program. How our nation's history can be embodied in a large-scale cultural landscape. What qualifies a remote historic landscape to become eligible for the National Landmark consideration, including site attributes in archaeology? And finally, what is AAPI Asian American Pacific Islanders? We hope this presentation has provided you more background on diversification of our historic preservation program so that more people can be engaged, including underrepresented Americans, providing racial equity and a greater sense of cultural identity for all people. Thanks again to the National Trust, to Barbara, Wyatt, Scott Baxter. I'm Terry Gouin.